for your ideas? What are the issues that, that are pressing on you as board members as you represent your community and, and so forth? So our, our goal is to have this be interactive. We do know that there's a, a very important person arriving at 11. So we will make sure that um, we are paying attention to the, the timeline for that. So I think we'll... We are, we're flexible. We'll, we'll, break it, we'll break at 11 for that. And, uh, and I guess the only thing I'm going to add, Susan's going to kind of <clears throat> lead us through this. I, I really, I remember a number of it because I was very, very involved in the 2007 development of the original master plan. Uh, the 2010 uh, updates, you and Don God. pretty much did that one. I was kind of reading things on the side that didn't get to come back. And so I'm, I'm really excited. And, and there's a lot of stability in this school district. There's, I, you know, I was here in 2007. And We're so still here. Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. There you are. Right there. <laughs> you know, it says a lot. But uh, it does. It says, it says a lot. So uh, you know, I just want to add my thanks for inviting us back. We're glad to be here. And we hope we can. Uh, can help you along. We're, we're, we're going to go through, so we're going to lead you through a little bit of a review. And, and we don't want to bore you, so we'll go kind of quickly. So if you have some questions or you want us to elaborate on something else, this is a workshop. So so I know you will, but feel free. Just jump right in because that's the purpose of this. And, and we don't want to, like I say, we don't want to waste your time, but we want to make sure we all have the same background information. Okay. Okay. So this is what we had planned by way of an agenda. We want to, as Ed said, do a, a quick review of where we were in 2010, give you a, a refresher on the data. We want to spend a, a little bit of time discussing some issues with you, hearing from you what your um, concerns and ideas are, developing some priorities, and then seeing if we can come up with some alternative solutions that we might um, provide for you. So um, with that, we'll jump into this. For those of you who were on the board in 2010, when Dodds and I came back, there had been a complete review of all of your facilities conducted in 2007. That complete review was redone based on the work that you had done since 2007. So Dodds and I visited every single school. He had actually looked at most of them before, but I was brand new. Dodds is an architect, and when he came, he looked at the building which is looking at the condition of the building. He's an architect, so he understands the systems that are involved. So he would have looked at the roofing and the plumbing and the flooring and the lighting and the windows. The condition of all of those things. Is the electrical system in good shape? Is the flooring in good shape? He also looks at the condition of the grounds. So that's the fourth column over there. The grounds means is the condition of the parking lot the sidewalks, the playground itself, the athletic fields. What's the condition of those facilities? The two in the middle are the two that I looked at. So I'm an educator by background. I hang out with architects a lot and planners a lot, but really my background is education. So I look at the buildings from an educator's perspective. When I walk in a school, I am looking at the parking lot, but I'm looking to see if there's enough space for all the parents to park when they come to volunteer during the day. I'm looking to see if there's enough space for the staff to park. I'm not looking at the condition of the parking lot. Dodds has already done that. But I'm looking at the, the spaces from an educational perspective. Can you find the office when you walk in? Or is it some place that you have to keep asking people, where is it located? which means there has to be good signage. Is the library in the right place, or is it located right next to the music room and the librarian and the music teacher are ready to kill each other? Is the first grade classroom so far away from the restrooms that you worry about kids making it down the hallway today? Is there a restroom in the kindergarten? So all of the things about a space that make it work for a school when you're at an elementary school, you're mainly looking at classrooms and some of the common spaces. But when you get to the middle school and high school level, you would want art to be taught in a genuine art room. You would want science to be taught in a science room that has appropriate flooring and appropriate counters and all of those kinds of things, different from a general classroom. Yes, you can shove science into a general classroom, but it's not really suitable. So in the suitability column, we looked at those kinds of things about each building. 
In the technology readiness column, we looked not at how many computers you have. You have a very robust technology system in this district. You should be, feel terrific about the work that you've done to provide technology for your students and your staff. But we looked at the infrastructure. Were there enough outlets in the room? of school the age of Floral City, if you haven't done any electrical upgrade there, there's usually one outlet in the front of the room because all they did was play the record player, maybe, or a movie projector, maybe. So we look at the infrastructure. What's in the walls? What's in, in support of the technology? Is there enough bandwidth and so forth? So what's shown up here is that data that we presented to you in 2010. And you can see the key, 90 to 100, for building and grounds is as good as you can get. There ain't nothing better unless you are brand new. You cannot get higher than a 90. So you can see Central Ridge was brand new when we got here. I think we were here the very first year that it had opened it. It was so fun to walk through that new building. Crystal River, we didn't really evaluate very much because it was in phased destruction. <laughs> and um, there were parts of it that were wrapped in plastic, there were parts of it that were brand new and very nice and we could tell what was coming, but um, other parts of it were the old building. So you can see that part is under construction. So you can look down using the key, 80 to 89 is good, 70 to 79 is starting to be a question about whether we need to put some emphasis into that building, 60 to 69 even more so, and less than 60 you can see is red. You can, at a glance. If we're on that one, just a, a quick now, you see that there's all those scores that Susan just explained to you. We always have a combined score. And a combined score is to refresh your memory. We, we put percentages on each of those other scores to come up with a combined score. The reason for that is, is that if you're going <coughs> to make the big picture decisions, what's our 10 year plan? What's our 20 year plan? You really want to look at the combined score, the overall issues around schools. <clears throat> Having said that, when it comes time to make the individual decisions about each school, it becomes much more important to look back at the individual scores. You know, for instance, okay, the one that scored the lowest <coughs> overall combined was, was Inverness uh, Primary School. Uh, and then you look across there, well, the ground scored, scored very well. Now we get to where, where it really what brought that score down was the suitability. So now let's go look at the detail. What did Susan find about that school? Is the suitability, was it, was it enough parking or was it that it doesn't have a music room or was it that it doesn't, let's, now let's dig into the detail. We have, and, and Alan brought all that with us as we get into this today, we get into discussions, we can quickly review any of that. But that's how that is meant to be, to be looked at, and the purpose for the combined score. Thank you. Questions about? That. Yeah. No, I just don't make a comment. I don't know if you noticed the pictures on the wall. That's yeah. Chris River High School. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's, and, and you've done some work at, at La Canto. Yes. Cafeteria too, and the new primary school yeah. is over here. Yeah, Alan was pointing that up. Yeah. What an amazing difference. The yeah. last time I was here, we just had a chance to drive through, drive around the high school. We didn't get a chance to go in. So we I'm have looking, time at the end looking of the forward to. If we, I was looking yeah. at those while we were waiting yeah. here. We have time because when I was here in 2007, I went over and spent quite, I did the suitability on Crystal River right. High School in 2007. So I remember that school. And I came in here and I saw those pictures. And so if I have, so if we have time this afternoon, I'll definitely want to go. If we have time this afternoon, <laughs> I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to take a drive over to Crystal I hope River you do. It's, well, yeah. those Correct. photographs are a testament of your work. Because if it hadn't been for your work, we wouldn't be at that point. Wow. So I think you really well, need to, to take credit for that, uh, pushing us into that, not pushing us, but leading us into that direction and, and giving us so. the courage to move forward on those projects so in the way sorry. that we did. Well, so I appreciate of, you saying that, but also you, you guys made it happen. Too. Yeah. You guys took, some, sometimes we do this work, people take the books and set them on shelves. And, and, and I talk about, you know, because I, I'm, I do a lot of presentations and things, and I talk about it. Well, and when I was here in 2010, it was very clear how much you had followed the plan that had been put in place in 2007, and you were on track and following yeah. along with that, which is part of the reason why we wanted to bring back this data and make sure everyone understood where we had been at that point. But you haven't stopped there. It's been two long years since I've seen Mr. Mullen and some of you <laughs> and in your schools. So 
we asked the district, what, so what has happened since we were, were here? But and before you go on, I just you, want to say, when you, when you go to, yeah, when you go to Chris River High School, I know you remember the deplorable condition the science lab was in. I remember that. And I know you remember that math was in the trailer park at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, make sure you go to the math classrooms and the science classrooms. State of the art. That's great. State of the art. That's great. That, that, that's Congratulations. That's really, it's just, uh, it, you know, it makes us in this business feel good. <clears throat> the science classrooms are like the college. I mean, so like we're, the college. we're in this business, you know, Susan and I both are former school administrators ourselves, former teacher school administrators. We're in this business because uh, because we, we make things better for kids. You're on you're a school board. You're a school board member, so you can make things better. Well, I, I taught for 30 teacher. years, and I never taught in a building that nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've also followed your projects in um, Boulder County. Oh, did you? Yeah, I, I have a, yeah. Um, yeah, the middle made, school, the high yeah. school, amazing renovations. They've made some, they've made some great strides yeah. in Boulder County. Including Colorado. that one middle school that all that was left was a front wall. All that was the front wall, <laughs> now it's even, yeah, but, but it, it's a state of the art behind that. Right? Yeah, with the yes. solar panels over the bike yeah. racks. I mean, I, I always tell Mike about that. I said, we have sunshine, why don't we do that? Well, we'll make recommendations okay. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can incorporate some energy efficiency things in here, Mike. You just keep smiling and we'll... We do have three that. schools, though, that we just got uh, solar panels that work right on. That's great. So you've done a lot of work since we were here in 2010, and we didn't want to not acknowledge that and and remind you of some of the things. I'm not going to go through all of these things. In fact, if there are questions about them, I'm going to turn to my good friend, Alan, who knows the details of these, because you guys have done the work and, and we haven't. But uh, Alan and his crew sent us this information so that we could add this to our understandings based on the work that you've done since 2010. So you can see this list of projects completed in it. They're at various buildings. Sometimes it's just renovating bricks. Sometimes it's replacing heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. But in Florida, replacing that makes a big difference in how well children can learn if it's in classrooms. Um, some of them are in, if you look at Rock Crusher, for example, that's in the kitchen. I I'm confident that those cooks greatly appreciated that. It probably didn't change the score of the building itself from a suitability perspective, but it would have changed the score from a building condition perspective. But we have not re-scored any of these. The next slide shows projects that are under construction. So Crystal River High School phase one, nearly complete, phase two, not quite as complete, and then there's some uh, County Road 486 road work. And then they also gave us a, a list of projects that were in the design phase where you are just talking about doing some work and having that um, put into designs to um, look at. So we went back to <coughs> the list that I just showed you from 2010 and said, okay, so how can we, how can we depict that? And you'll see we've added another symbol key there the dot means projects completed. The triangle, open triangle, means projects in the design phase. And we're still under construction at uh, Crystal River High School, as you can see. But um, Rock Crusher, for example, has a dot for a project completed and a dot for projects in design phase. The dot for a project completed was that HVAC system in the kitchen and now you are doing designing for again a kitchen a full kitchen renovation you've already put the hvac in there so that's how that shows the other uh, any, any questions on that that new key system that we added in there to represent the projects that you've done when will we get the score on Chris River primary um you won't get a score on Crystal River Primary unless, ever, in, ever <laughs> unless you hire us to come back and do a scoring on Crystal River Primary, and we would be delighted. I'd love to come to <laughs> Citrus County and, and do school facility. I'd love to, to do that, but we, don't, we haven't planned to do that at, at this point. We'll leave that in your well, when you look at this, hands. When you look at this, and you almost have to go back, and you know, we just went back for the purpose of today to the, what the 2010 scores were, and, and if you go back to the 2007, you see what, what you've done here, what you've done is, is you have followed the, 
the, the, where we saw the greatest needs, and the greatest needs were at Crystal River uh, Elementary, at, 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 at Crystal River High School that was under construction at that point. They, there was the greatest need for the, for the new facilities because of the growth in the north central part of the county. And so you have followed that and it brings you to where you are today. What's left, if you go back to the 2007 report, and I brought it with me so I can show it to you if you want to go back to that, you're now to the point to where the ones that you're looking at. We still, we still got that little left red that jumps out at us at Inverness Primary School, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's where you are now. We still have, if you, if you look at Floral City, it's, uh, we, we still have the yellow there. And then when you start looking at, when we get to, and Susan's gonna get in just a minute to the, the utilization and capacities, and that it's bring, it kind of brings us to where you are today and the things you're zeroing on. What is the suitability uh, problem at Inverness Primary? Um, we actually looked at that, looked at that a, little bit a little bit ago. Some of the classrooms are... So, um, Mr. <coughs> Kennedy wasn't on the board at, at that point, but for each of the schools that we did, just as a reminder, there is a um, collection of reports. There are those four reports for each school. So there would be a building uh, report, and for each building there is a separate report because if a building was new, newly built, it would have a different roof of a different age, a different HVAC system age than a building that, um, if you think about Floral City, that old building that you have renovated for the library and the administration is very different than the cafeteria, is very different than the new um, classroom wing that was added there. So each building will have a separate page and then there'll be a separate report for, for suitability, technology readiness, and grounds. And so Inverness Primary, traffic was poor, parking traffic. was fair, um, general size classrooms, they were smaller than your standard. In many cases the, the storage was inadequate. The library was uh, only fair, it was not well located. Um, there's no space there for performing arts at Inverness Primary. Um, the administration location was not um, good, the size was not good, and student restrooms, counseling, all of those things were either poor or unsatisfactory. So it does have the lowest score of any of your schools in left remaining in the district. Left. Crystal River had the lowest score of the elementaries before you took it on and did the did the renovations because the score for for um, Inverness Primary right now is below 60, which is why it's in the red. So any other questions about that? I think what the other thing that it does show is that you have put your maintenance dollars into fixing some pieces of the problems. Maintenance dollars are best applied to problems in the building column or the grounds column. You can't, with your maintenance budget, fix very many things relative to suitability. For example, if the classrooms are too small, you're not likely to knock out a wall and move it 10 feet out farther. Now you might add a new wing of classrooms or you might add a new library or you might renovate something else. But with, with maintenance and kind of keeping the school district going kinds of dollars, you're not going to have enough money to fix most things in that suitability column. And this shows that you really have put your dollars into fixing the things that you can with your maintenance dollars at the schools that needed it. And that's, that's again, uh, a, a statement of the kinds of work that you have taken on and the, the priorities that you've set over time. So Ed said a minute ago we were gonna look at enrollment and utilization because it's just as important to know how crowded your buildings are now and what they'll look like in the future. So what we've given you here is the board capacity, this is the elementary, we'll give you the middle school and high school in a second. Um, the capacity that you as a board have set, what the enrollment was in 0910, what the enrollment is currently 
in 1213, and we've gotten that from the district. Mr. Dixon has been terrific about giving us the data that we needed in order to make this current. You can see Central Ridge, for example, has a capacity of 810. In 0910, it had 703. It's grown, it's now at 771. Its projected enrollment for 2014-15 is 757, a slight decrease. Then the columns off to the right are again color-coded to show whether they are in the band that, that we've sort of deemed accept, uh, acceptable, not accessible, acceptable, and show for 209, 10, 12, 13, <coughs> and then what the projected utilization is out in 2014, 15. So again, you can look down the list and see, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, Forest Ridge Elementary is your most crowded school. It is over capacity. It was in 2009-10. It's going to be again. At the moment, it doesn't appear to be. Pleasant Grove is also overcrowded, and Rock Crusher is going to be overcrowded in the future. Okay, questions on that one? It's Central Ridge, it looks like, from what we've had. Central Ridge is more crowded than it was in 0910, but it's... But currently it's more crowded than Rock Crusher. Now, when do we expect to build a new school? Well, we've changed that. Okay. Yeah. We said five years now, it's more like it's 10 yeah. years. <laughs> or more. Okay. Yeah. So, it, but I mean, what you need to realize is that you're do, what you're doing now is exactly what we recommended. One of our recommendations in both 2007 and again in 2010 is to make sure you're paying attention to what's happening now. Because we did four different methodologies in order to create that projected enrollment. We use four different approaches to doing that. We use cohort survival, we use a linear regression model, we use a number of students per household model, we use a um, city county uh, uh, kindergarten roll-up number, I mean a, a live birth to kindergarten enrollment number. And all of those statistics put together gave us the <coughs> projection for 2014-15. Well, it, it's only as good as the methodology and it creates a line, but that line will change with new data. And that's what we recommended that you do, is that you keep looking every year and run those methodologies in order to say, well, were we right? Were we close? Well, in some cases we were, and in some cases we weren't. It looks as though there are some, some movements of kids here. We don't know from where we sit whether you moved some children or whether a business moved in or a business moved out, but that's exactly what you need to be doing is looking at the enrollment every year and making that next projection. The, the trouble comes when you have a place that goes from um, 76 to 89, like Crystal River Primary, look at that. In two years, it's supposed to go from yellow to the, almost the top of the green. <clears throat> so, it, as it, it is inter inter information, interesting information and helpful information that you have to update annually in order to know where you are. And you do an outstanding job of, of uh, presenting in the form that you present. It's, it's <coughs> clearly understandable. Good. And you know, okay. some companies have a lot of statistics lines going all over the place, and it takes you three hours to read the chart. No. But this, this is very readable. Very Great. Readable. Okay. Thank you. And you, what you can see from this, you can see because you're talking about it, and, and, and we applaud you. I think we gave you a commendation for having, for having purchased property ahead of time, knowing where you've got some sites for future elementary schools, for a future middle school, or, 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 or I think high school, high school up in the north. And so we, we applaud you for that. The bottom line on here is let's, let's look at the reality. When you look at the reality of, the, of what your capacity is and what your projected is for elementary total, you're, the state of Florida is not going to. Is not, is not going to fund another elementary school in this district for a while. And, and I know all of you know that. And that's why it's been pushed out of us. So what this means we got to look at is let's start looking at what are the issues in between here. You know, is this a problem 
that can be solved through and maybe an addition here or there? Is it a problem that can be solved by maybe getting rid of some portables here or there? Is it a problem that can be solved by, by uh, moving some boundaries around? And you need to look at your school sizes. What is the appropriate school size? And, and we all know we've got the issue. You look on there, and most of your elementary schools, the capacities are in the seven or eight hundreds, and then you've got two that are in the four to five hundreds. And, and so it is that, and, and, and there's probably very, very good reasons. It almost always is. But there's, there, we have to dig down, and that's the issues that I think this workshop is about. So let's just show to you from middle school and high school as well, okay. so that you can see middle schools, you, you don't have any overcrowding issues there at all. In fact, you have one school, Crystal River Middle, that is um, un underutilized at the moment at the, in the yellow band. Um, but we'll move back up into, or the orange band, but we'll move back up into the yellow band um, in the future. But middle schools appear to be okay, um, and no issues there. However, Lacanto High School is large now, and is going to be larger still uh, into, the, into the future. It, it's interesting to me that having built a new high school at Crystal River, that um, that, that enrollment is just gradually kind of sneaking up. It'll be interesting to see if that actually attracts more kids. Usually, when you build a new one, you, you uh, get more students in the next couple of years. So you're seeing a little bit of that happen there. And there, and there may be some op opportunity to make some decisions regarding what the numbers look like at Crystal River versus the numbers of looking at And I'm sure that's not a surprise to anybody here. There may be some opportunity. Questions on enrollment and utilization? Okay. So um, this last piece is just a reminder, and it's not what we're recommending or anything. This is directly out of the 2010 report that Dodds and I did for you. It is what we estimated the budget might need to be in order to address the deficiencies that were identified at each of these schools. So you can see at Floral City Elementary School, 3.3 million to address the issues that existed there. You have portable classrooms there, you have a cafeteria that's too small, you have a sewage treatment plant that's in the wrong spot. There are several other things at that site that would need to be addressed. Inverness Primary has more problems. Remember, it's your lowest scoring elementary school at this point, 6.3 million. A little bit for Lacanto Primary School, a little bit for Rock Crusher Elementary School. There were some uh, issues with Citrus Springs Middle School, but more for Inverness. Remember that had a yellow on suitability for Inverness Middle School as well. There are issues at Inverness Middle School that I'm sure I don't need to tell you about, as we were talking this morning and I was saying, oh, this is the school that's down that long road and it's in the middle of that neighborhood and you, and now I hear there's a Publix going in right there on that corner. That will add another little wrinkle to the, to the fund, trying to get in Probably out of there. The Publix going in at, at Inverness right Middle. Right across, across the street here. from us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but right down the road from the middle school. Yeah. Yeah. You're moving out. Away that was a mistake in the Chronicle. Um, it's the reverse. They're going to be a farther away. Ah, okay. All right. Then I take back my concern about that. You, you, you can't always believe what you read in our paper. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mistake. Okay. And then you can see um, some some costs to uh, do renovations really on Lacanto High School. And I know you've done quite a bit. I was admiring the photos of the new cafeteria. That's a, a wonderful uh, addition to uh, that school. That's terrific to see. So the original um, proje budget projection for the sites with deficiencies in 2010 was a near $31 million. And um, we were explaining to some of your facilities guys, we did some work for the United Arab Emirates a few years ago and evaluated all their schools. And when we completed that work, they said, well, what's it gonna cost us to fix all the deficiencies here? And we presented them the, the bill that it would take to fix all of those. And I always think of the United Arab Emirates as you know, printing money in barrels of oil, you know, and it's just endless. And even they said, oh, we can't afford that. 
So our sort of standard response is we've never found any place that could actually <coughs> afford to do all of the repairs of all the buildings that need some, some uh, renovation or fixing some deficiencies. So we weren't surprised when you told us that you really couldn't afford the $31 million that we projected that it would likely cost to fix all those deficiencies. That there may be some different needs now, but we wanted to at least remind you of what that had been at the time. So what we wanted to do was to focus briefly on the schools that there had been an interest expressed by the board. And we had an original group of four. We are now up to seven. So we're just going to kind of go back and remind you about each of the seven schools that appear to have some specific issues. Some of this data we've given to you before, but um, we wanted to remind you that. So Citrus High School, um, it was a renovation. You're, you're working on it right, um, you got it right here. Um, you can see the facility score, you can see the suitability score in the mid 70s. Technology was in good shape. Site score, because it's sitting right here on the highway, is 81. Combined score of 81. And you can see what the enrollment is. So that was one of the buildings. Citrus Springs Middle School <clears throat> was a phase three <coughs> recommendation from the 2007 master plan to renovate and do a boundary change. Facility score was 84. You can see what the other scores were. The site was probably the lowest score there. There were site issues. Floral City Elementary was a phase two 2007 recommendation for a renovation facility condition of 89. The lowest score there was the suitability. You've done some work there, but the cafeteria is still, still too small and you have portables out behind. Fernando the, was a phase two for a renovate and a possible boundary change. The lowest score there was the suitability score, again, some issues relative to that building. Inverness Primary, suitability score, there's your lowest, 59.59. Renovation needed. And then Inverness Middle, with a suitability score of 72, is your lowest middle school score and a phase two renovation recommendation. Questions about any of, I went through that really quickly, but we had looked at so much of that before. Last one was Pleasant Grove. Phase three, reno, renovate, boundary change. The suitability score was the lowest area there. And it's the one that's over enrolled. So that brings us through the information piece. Questions about any of that before we move on? Okay. So at this point, we really wanted to have a conversation with you and have it less be a presentation from us, but more a listen to you as board members, identify your issues, questions, or concerns, and explore. These are some issues that we thought might um, be important, but we also are willing to explore uh, others that you might want to put on the table at this point before we get into some solutions. We thought it would be good to explore some issues. And so the first one is the is the, the school size issue that we just kind of uh, uh, spoke to. Before we can come up with, you know, where what 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 are your priorities now? I mean, it's actually it's, <clears throat> I don't want to, to to make this sound too simple, but I mean it's actually let's look at the next things that need to happen. Well, the next things that need to happen, you needed to do some some renovations at Inverness Primary School. You need to do those renovations at at Floral City. But before we get into, you know, what is the what where's the priorities in that? You always want to make your decisions for your for your short-term uh, issues 
in line with what your long-term vision is. That's what a master plan is all about. So that, that when you make some decisions here, you don't you don't go in and spend a lot of money in a school. That long-term, you say no, that, that school is going to be replaced. So you want to have that kind of in, in your mind. So the first thing, one of the things that I wanted to get on the table with you is this the school size issues. And, uh, and are you okay with, uh, we couldn't find a board policy here that said that you know, we're gonna have elementary schools of this size to this size, or, or middle schools, and, that, and most districts don't have that, some do. Um, it, it, are you, right now, you've got most, let's start with the elementary schools. You've got most of your elementary schools, as I said, in the seven, 800 capacity range. You've got two of them that are in the four to 500 capacity range. Is that, is that something we need to be looking at? Is that okay? Yeah, we, we have we had a discussion yeah. Yeah, a number of years ago. We didn't set a policy, but we set a threshold that we didn't want our elementary schools to go over 850. Mm -hmm. okay. um, our, our high schools, we were looking at 1500, but of course we exceeded that. And that was a lot of the discussions about Christian River High School. Was what would we build the capacity for? And part of that was the restrictions on the state. But I think we added some capacity with the idea that we would probably have to rezone Lepanto when that project was completed. And um, middle school, what were we, 1,200? Maybe 1,200, yeah. And we have, you know, with this change in um, population growth, it hasn't been an issue anymore for us right now. Thank goodness we haven't seen that grow. So I think with a little rezoning, we can probably even everybody out a little bit better. <coughs> Except that it, and that became comes some of the conversation maybe for later, but like Inverness Middle uh, to Citrus Springs Middle, those are kind of ones that don't allow quite of that maxim of maximizing because we don't have that phase three done at Citrus right. Springs Middle, where we can balance those two schools out perhaps. So if that was if that became a priority to get the phase three done at Citrus Springs Middle, it would allow you that flexibility. Right. So that would be where our growth would be. <laughs> yeah. And that was planned all along when yeah. the school was designed. It was designed well to be 1,200, but yeah. was built to 600. Yeah. It was a good decision by the board because it's allowed a lot of flexibility. That was before all of us. Before us. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good decision. Yeah, they're building that. on their legacy. It's yeah. still, it, it, it was a good. I would think Sam was on the board for that, I think I was there at the end of it. Yeah, and I couldn't figure out how to get the kids there because it was yeah, the boats. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And that became some of the zoning issue, I believe. So okay, elementary schools of not bigger than 850, heard that, heard that clear. Is there a lower limit? Is there a low limit? You don't want elementary schools smaller than? We've talked about that. We have talked about that. But we've got a couple of communities that our elementary schools are just the hub of the neighborhood, even though they're small. And they cost us, you know, 50% more per pupil to operate. Um, you know, Home Assess, as you showed within those numbers, they have trended down from 91% uh, utilization down to 78% utilization. And even Floral City moved down from 76% to 74%. Um, and you know, that became a question is with IPS, as we know, you know, they're, they're pushing, uh, they, they, they've maintained for the most part, but does that become a, you know, a suitability where there could be some balancing done between those two schools. Um, I know we have, again, issues with DOE, and, and we've talked about that with Alan. Of, of, there are some challenges. It's not as simple as saying we're going to take 100 units here and move 100 units there, but it would be nice. You know, and I think the, the next thing that's unpredictable is what is the future of the growing movement of charter schools and online schools. Um, I think what we're going to see is less of a need for brick and mortar schools as we move towards that virtual school um, uh, delivery model. And um, our state board of education recently, last week, put as their one of their goals is to increase the number of charter schools in Florida next year by 50 percent. So, yeah. Our State Board of Education is very pro-charter school. The president of the State Board of Education is on a KIPP, uh, actually the only KIPP school in Florida, and has donated a million dollars towards that school, the development of that school. So it's very committed to the expansion of charter schools. And behind him, behind the State Board of Education, 
um, of which none of the members currently sitting there are advocates of public education that we perceive. Or educators. Um, yeah. Um, is a lot of guiding from behind the scenes of my uh, former governor, Jeff Bush, who also is a very big advocate, as, it, as is his partner, Michelle Ree, in the proliferation of charter schools and coming on the ballot this, um, no, not that, legislatively this year, they're trying to push a parent trip act again. It failed last year by a 50-50 uh, vote by the state senate. So they're pushing very hard to get that Parent Trigger Act back on to the laws in Florida. So you know the repercussions of that will be. When you say that the state board is wanting to increase it by 50%, are those the schools that are um, under the auspices of the school board or independent charters? Well, they're privately owned but publicly funded charters. And currently the law says that the, that the, the charters must be approved by the school board. But if the school board rejects the charter, they have the ability to appeal to an independent board that then uh, reports to the Board of Education. And we have seen last year, I don't know, probably 80% of the schools that were uh, rejected by school boards were then approved by this other board. I mean, there's a very concerted effort and they're not making any bones about it anymore about that school choice, as they call it, the charter school movement in Florida is the wave of the future. And will be heavily approved and heavily funded. And, and we also have on our ballot this time an amendment called Amendment 8, which allows um, uh, any institution to access uh, tax dollars, uh, including religious institutions. And you could have our private religious schools then access public school uh, education funds, if that passes. So what does that mean? It means that we're going to be shutting our <laughs> schools down. <laughs> what does that mean? I, let, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go over. What does that mean for facility planning in Citrus? I, I don't, you know, that's a good question. I think you don't know, because Citrus County has been, has been knock on wood, immune from the charter school movement until this year. We've had our first actual um, application by an, an, uh, an exterior um, group that's kind of trying to proliferate themselves all over Florida. I think you need to ask us November 7th. Yeah. Um, but I think going forward, obviously, that is the push. And I think um, the um, encouragement from the state level is that charter schools will be um, the fair hair child. And I think we will begin to see that infiltration, certainly in Citrus County. In other counties, they have hundreds of charter schools. And when they open, they attract a thousand students. Um, so, you know, other districts have dealt with closing schools as the, as the population diminishes. Um, so, I think we have to keep that in mind. Um, we talk about adding student stations that maybe, not so much. Say, hey, yeah. Hey. <laughs> maybe we need to sit where back. Are we, where are we I want to go back to something you said a minute ago, Mr. Kennedy, about um, that those two small elementary schools cost you 50% more to operate. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that okay that you're spending that much more at those small schools? Or is that a problem for the constituents in Inverness and Crystal Springs, Crystal River, Long Springs? Um, is it okay to the to the rest of the county that you're doing that? Or is has is that a point of tension? I, I, don't, I don't think, think it's been an issue. issue. No, that yeah, hasn't been an issue. issue. I mean, we've had principals before that <laughs> wanted to make an issue of that, um, looking at their operating costs, and we said, why don't we just each get our pro rata share of operating costs, and, and you know, so they don't get more than we do because they're smaller. That one elementary school has just been singled out of one out of 1,800 or 18,000? Which one was it? 1,800. Okay, 1,800 as a exemplary school with um, over 50% free and reduced student population. And still made the UIP. They became, mm -hmm. they are, you know, out of the state of Florida, they were highly recognized and um, highly performing. So not the kind you want to be shutting down. No. Uh, they ranked 55th in so, the state last year yeah, out of those 1,800. Yeah, they were top 10%, top I think. 
So, and then awesome uh, school. Same, but the same, but also the same time, uh, Central Ridge also met most of those um, criteria. So, we're finding that those small schools are also highly successful. Homeless <laughs> Elementary School was our first elementary school that was consistently a school every year. I mean, they outscored almost every other school as far as number of a a school, so it, we would be happy maybe to do all of our schools at 400. <laughs> good, you can do all of 400. Yeah. And, and there, are some, there are some research that says yeah. that could be a good idea. The trouble is that in some of those communities, yeah. they are older communities. They are not communities that tend to have our growth. And so while you know 400 might be good, unfortunately in some cases, and Homo Sass is a good example of that, you know, it's dropping you know, substantially because there isn't well, because I just, I think a lot of those, they're not in those areas. They're moving to the Pine Ridge, Central Ridge areas. They're moving to uh, to those Citrus Hills areas. LA, Lower Alabama. So yeah. that, that leads sort of to the next discussion <clears throat> that we have on the list, which is program considerations. Because when that happens in some districts, um, they decide to put a world language magnet program at that school where the native population in the neighborhood is declining. And I know that you've done that at your high schools. You have a, a fine arts program. You have an IB program that's located at only one school. So talk to us about program at equity. Do you, I mean, how important is that? Would that be an idea or a solution to to move kids through that rather than you changing just attendance boundaries? Talk, talk to us about some program considerations and if equity is a an issue that you wrestle with. You've got a puzzled look on your face. No, each, each of the schools, of the high schools, they have a, a center like art or, right. or IB or right. business and that sort of thing. So when you're talking about equity, we don't feel like there's an imbalance there. That each other because has children something. can choose which they one can they choose, want they can go to, the, to go school. To. Which, but which that's not to. true at the elementary, right? But we have, this is one of the things that you, is unique about Citrus County. Our demographics vary a little bit, but we're more homogeneous than not. Yes. And um, we have been able to uh, achieve similar or almost identical student performance at all of our schools. There's high level of collaboration between schools, between principals, um, certainly. Uh, the district operates as a total, not as individual schools. So we don't see pockets. We don't have, what is it, you know, you, your grades are based on your zip code or something. Um, we, we haven't experienced that. And I think one of the things that we pride ourselves on and why we've been so successful is because you could go from any of our schools to any other of our schools and the students would experience the same high quality education, the same kind of programs, the same philosophy. Um, and because of maybe the size of the district, we've been able to maintain that. Middle schools, uh, again, I've never heard anybody talk about inequity other than we have a pilot program going right now with iPads at one of our schools. Um, and the high schools, the students <coughs> haven't had that many students who requested to go out of zone to go to one of our magnet programs yet that has caused a problem other than we're seeing grow, growing enrollment up at Kansas High School because of the IB program. And that may be something we have to address. But that really is the only singular program that has caused an increase in enrollment at any school. Okay. All right. Well, some, in some places also, <clears throat> the size of space determines the kind of staffing that is supported there. Um, we worked in a school district where if you had three third grades and three fourth grades, you didn't have a full-time PE teacher because there weren't enough sessions of, of third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade. Whereas if you were a school that had four sessions, you did have a full-time PE teacher. Are there programmatic issues relative to size of schools that are that cause you difficulty or are issues between schools? Because you, I mean, you do have some that are half the size of yeah, others. Yeah. To the chart, we we um, look at staffing based on number of students at all of our schools, whether it's with our teachers on special assignment or ESC teachers, and some of our, our two smaller schools sometimes will share a staffing. So we do that. You know, and the other thing is, we just went through a very <clears throat> um, in-depth budget um, review process involving a lot of people, support staff, teachers. Um, 
this last year. And our final, our final destination on that was that while we know that maybe in some schools we maybe had an extra PE teacher and that um, other districts didn't have, um, that we wanted to maintain the level of instruction. We didn't want to decrease any program by diminishing instruction because that would hurt quality programs. So we've invested our money in maintaining some of those programs and staffing levels and that some of them um, might even fall into the luxury category in some, at some times. But we made that decision with our budget constraints, um, and so. But do you? I mean, there there are choices. Yeah, there and are. You can spend choose to spend your money on X or choose to spend your money on Y, and and um, when you have an opportunity to go through that kind of a budget <coughs> conversation, you have a chance to to redecide on your priorities. Where do your priorities lie? And I, I commend you for having taken that activity and and gone through that because that's exactly what needs to happen. The next issue that we identified was just this whole thing about boundaries and attendance zones. And, uh, and, and Susan likes to, likes to use the example of, of uh, when she's talking to districts about this, do you want to do you want to deal with, uh, with chronic pain or acute pain? Do you want to uh, <laughs> have this going on all the time? <laughs> do you want to every year we look at And some districts choose to do it that way. Some districts say, we are gonna, we're going to look at boundaries and change them every year because because we want our, we just we want that to be part of our culture. That that's something that, that we we deal with that and we balance things based on that. Okay? Other districts say no, we're not interested in that at all. That if we tell if a person buys a home in this location that they know that their child's going to go to this school and that's going to be available to them and here's the feeder pattern and that's going to work. And so under that one, then usually when it when it has to be done, then you do the rather than the chronic, you do the acute. We're gonna we're gonna do it now and then we're gonna put this in place for. For uh, for uh, a lengthy period of time, is is Citrus a district that uh, I mean? There's some things that jump out at me when I look at it. Just coming in, I haven't been here for five years. Come back in, uh, I automatically say I looked at the maps and said we well, got this brand new beautiful uh, uh, <coughs> Crystal River High School. You got La Canto High School that's overcrowded. Um, why don't I just chop a piece off here or down here or over there? Why don't I just do that and just move the kids? And, and I, I'm not that naive. I know that there's always political ramifications and where people want to go, where people think that they should be going. There's all those kinds of issues. Are, is that something, when you talk to us a little bit about that for, from the Citrus County perspective? Acute pain. Yes. Uh, right, acute. We don't want to every year start changing these, which are trying to not disrupt uh, the students' uh, lives and where they're attending, or the parents, <coughs> which I do the very best to be able to keep it sort of uh, even. The, the only thing I would say, and I would agree with that, except I would say that it is generally still going to be cheaper for us to move students than to build buildings in certain areas. I mean, and, and I, again, if we put a lot of infrastructure into IPS, for example, to make that a 700, 800 station school, only to then be um, that that isn't where the st students are unless we're having to rezone them. Do we instead say what we need to do is we can we can balance them out differently between PGE, Floral City, and IPS, and not have and say okay, well right now the trending is moving this way, the trending is moving that way. Because I don't know in those three schools if we show trending of increasing in any one direction in those three areas. Those areas, I don't think you do. And so it, it, to me, it becomes a decision of, you know, do you either, if you don't have the monies now, do you say, well, we, we can balance by saying right now we're going to move some to Floral City, where there's capacity. Um, but we might now, if we have money, that might change in a different way. I don't know, I'm just thinking that it's cheaper to move students than it is to build buildings. That's true. But if I was a parent, I would tell you this, I would be pretty angry if my kids got rezoned because uh, their school was accepting so many out of zone students. For Absolutely. Absolutely. We've seen that years ago, um, and they were right. Yeah. Um, so um, I would agree with that. I think the program considerations probably need to be addressed before boundary changes and attendance zones. Good point. 
often comes up. And IPS, I think, is one of the schools that we had a lot of out of zones. Do we know? Oh, because people working. Because of people working. But that's it's not overcrowded. I mean, you know, we've had a really stagnant growth in that whole part of the county. Right. And at one time, like right, there was a developer, we thought was coming in. It's not this year or it's not overcrowded. It's been in the past. Yeah. It's not this year, is it? I don't know where this is. IPS. IPS is high because of the hospital. But it wasn't a, wasn't an overcrowded issue. This year. No. I have a, I mean, Pleasant Grove has crowding issues. Uh, and we're doing an enrollment study currently, which the results will be finalized probably in December. And uh, you know, there, we will prioritize the elementary schools that need to have uh, relief in some fashion and make a recommendation, probably rezoning, as well as the high schools. We don't anticipate any issues with the middle school. But uh, we are looking at that. And uh, Pleasant Grove is always a little higher than the average because of the hospitals. I mean, the IPS. IPS. But they're still under capacity. By a hundred, I think, right now. At one point, I think they had like almost 900 kids. I don't know where those kids were. I mean, we rezoned them, I guess, to Hernando, and then Hernando's kids got rezoned to Central Ridge. <coughs> we built a new school. I think that's what that we have shifted everybody in that direction. It's almost uh, 11 o'clock, the time for the uh, time, sir. Uh, board, do you need like the five minutes we have left for that to take a short break and come back? Or? No. no, you're okay. okay. So, why don't do you want to take a break? Now that would be fine with us, and the, the board doesn't the board yeah, doesn't need to. Yeah. So we'll yeah. No, we'll, I mean, we'll, go ahead and yeah, we'll go. That's right. If you'll take a little break, that'll we'll be great. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> Now, Rich, I thought I dreamed this. I was talking with Linda Burr because I've been out of state, and she said something about uh, uh, the dog was going to come. And I woke up the next morning. I thought. I dreamed there was going to be a dog at our meeting. <laughs> so I called and she said, no, you're dreaming. Well, good morning, everyone. Mrs. Simmel, good morning. School board members, good morning. Ms. Mom, good morning. Um, this is a very exciting time for us. We, I, I'm not going to take much of your time, except that I would just like to tell you that uh, Tommy Lee is uh, very special to us. He is a, a mood maker and a mood breaker, and I will give you an example of each of those. And then uh, Ms. Haynes, who has done all the legwork and everything for this to happen at Crest, uh, so you have an opportunity to hear from her, and of course see our star, uh, Tommy Lee. Uh, perfect example of just an enhancer. If you were to be at our bus stop in the mornings, and you see those students get off the bus, and sometimes, uh, in working with Ms. Haynes, she has been working diligently on communication. And when Tommy Lee is out there, the communication with those kids and the interaction with him and, and all the students and so forth, and also the staff, is overwhelming. You, you just see a mood change or an enhancer. Um, in the afternoons, I stand out by the very first bus, and there's a young man, and I'll, I'll just tell you, his first name is Brandon. And Brandon is quite a character, and uh, but I've always made it a point to try to give him a high five when he gets on the bus to go home. It's right by the bus where I'm at. And I was out there, and he, I think we kind of like it because he gives me one, and we go on, and he gets on the bus. Well, I did not know that Mrs. Haynes, or Miss Haynes, was behind me or close to me with Tommy Lee. And at that point, when I was ready to give him the high five, Brandon walked right by me and went to Tommy Lee. So I guess you could say I've kind of gone with the dogs a little bit, but that's okay because he is, uh, he is very special to us. And you'll even see with Red Ribbon Week, he also has one of the uh, big bands on, on, it, on his collar there. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Ms. Haynes. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this presentation and probably have a lot of questions for her, but thank you for having us. And his resume is in there as well. Um, Tommy Lee said, "My boy." Um, everything's been adapted for him. Like Mr. Hilbert was saying, we really worked hard on communication. So his best is adapted with communication <coughs> sentence strips, where the students can come up and tell me what they want to do with Tommy Lee, whether they want to hug him or brush him or pet him. Um, he also wears a control your feelings for our EBD kids, where they can come and tell me what number they are on his on the scale of emotions. Um, 
He also brought his communication device this morning to show you guys what he has to say. Sometimes when he goes into the classroom, if you'd like to see him do that. So let's get that out. I don't know if it'll be loud enough for everybody to hear, but we'll hope. He just went to WTI and spent some time with the Transition Academy, so he's been wired up this morning already. Let's go. Good boy. How many push? Good boy. So he he helps motivate kids to do use their communication devices in the classroom. We try really hard to make sure that, that kids are motivated to speak. We have a large population of nonverbal students. We don't want them left out. So a lot of the kids won't use their communication devices for whatever reason. But when he comes in and uses his, it motivates them. We also use him to motivate, sit buddy, don't sit, good boy. We also use him to motivate for uh, mobility. We have a lot of kids that are in walkers and wheelchairs and he'll be at one end of the hallway and they will come running in whatever <laughs> capacity they can. In years past, you could dangle food, anything, and they weren't gonna move. It's been a really long process. Um, you know, we had to apply for an application then there was a phone interview, then there was a personal interview, and then there was two weeks that I spent learning how to work with him, because he does have 40 commands, and sometimes I forget some of them. But um, he's been great. The kids love him, the staff loves him, I love him, my daughter loves him. <laughs> so it's been pretty good all around. But I'm willing to answer any questions you guys might have. Oh, shoot. Can you tell We're us coming down to you. some of the things that he knows how to do? I see your list, but maybe you can Sure. Um, he can open and close doors. He can push and pull wheelchairs. He can open and close doors and doors. Um, he can access communication devices. He, we just did a demonstration with some of the kids, well, adults at the Transition Academy. He can pick up things that a kid drops out of a wheelchair and hand it back to the student, which gives them a little bit more independence than an adult doing it. Doesn't make them feel quite as bad about that. Um, there you can board now. Um, <laughs> he can turn on and off lights. But really, for the most part, he is just a fierce motivator. He, kids will come, EBD students will come to my office when they're having a rough day, and within five minutes, they're ready to return to class after they've been petting with him. Really? You know, he's, he calms down staff. Sometimes staff comes to my office and says, I just need a little Tommy Lee time. That's fine, come on in, you know. But he's been great. Yeah, he spends all his day with you? Mm -hmm. so, when, so when he's gonna interact with the students, he's with you on a lead? Yes. Okay, so he doesn't just wander around the school? No. He, 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 he takes, he's off leave in the afternoon after the students leave, and he'll walk with me to the front office, or you know, we'll throw a ball for him in the hallway just so he has a little bit of fun in the afternoon. But no, he's on lead, and if, if I have to go deal with the crisis, or I need to assist in something else, and I'm in a classroom, I just pass him off to the instructional staff member, and I come back. They're just not allowed to give him any of his commands when I'm not present. I see. We get something for Tommy Lee here, special oh. for him. Everybody, let's go. Tommy Lee is one of our newest aides. Tommy Lee, you now have a uh, oh, IP badge. <laughs> yeah, we sent out the information on the, the whole Teacher of the Year and whatnot, and I said to everybody, he's not worked with us more than three years, so he can't be nominated. <laughs> How old is he? He'll be three. Hey, he'll be three on Saturday. And where did you all get him from? Canine Companions for Independence in Orlando. And I did bring some brochures to hand to you guys, so if you ever have any questions, you can just hand the person the brochure on Canine Companion. So he was a dog that went through their program? Yes, he wasn't mine. They're all bred through California, and they're shipped off to puppy raisers all over the U.S. Um, they're trained, they live with the puppy raiser for a year, and then they go, if they pass the assessment test, they move into the facility for another year to two, and sometimes they don't even make it after that. They have to, they have to deal with all sorts of rigorous yeah. things. Wow. He's not a service dog. He's a facilities assistance dog. It's the same thing as a service dog, though. He can do everything a service dog can do. <laughs> you know, I told, after I'd had a chance to visit with Tommy Lee myself, I, I had mentioned it to a couple of principals who have, you know, various challenged students, and the first thing was, how can we get one? Yes. What was that? So, but the question I would say is, is that, I mean, it's very impressive, the things you've talked about. Is it something that you would say that a school or an individual at a school that is willing to take that on, that it is beneficial to that school and to those students? It is a huge responsibility. Um, I was just talking to some of the students today at WTI and they were saying, well, what's the biggest challenge that you have? And I said, 
just maneuvering. You don't think about it when you go to sit down somewhere or walk through a doorway. I mean, little challenges like that, but the responsibility of having a, an animal that you have to take care of is huge. I think that at Crest it's a huge benefit because our entire <coughs> population benefits from him. Would I say that a classroom teacher with ESC students would benefit as much? Probably not, just because it's a lot of work for one classroom. You know, with it being an entire school, I feel like it benefits, but for one room, I think it would be a huge endeavor to take on for that. How old is he? He'll be three this Saturday. Gosh, you learned fast. Then. Yeah. It really is. Well, I can't take any credit for him either. People always say, well, where, where did you train him? Well, I didn't do that. Day night companions did all the work. Do you have to go back for any retraining with him? Yes. 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 Um, we went back for recertification two weeks ago. Um, and our certification lasts for a year. So every year we have to go back and, and prove, it's called an ADI test, to prove that we know how to maneuver him still in a public setting. So we go to the mall. Uh, which all the distractions. He's not a big mall person. Neither am I, so. <laughs> I wonder how Mr. Blocker writes up dog food on our list of expenses. <laughs> Actually, Rich makes it at the school. Oh. <laughs> Does Rich make it or do the students make it? We used to have well, to have a dog and cat fish. As long as the bill doesn't come, uh, come in, Mr. Blocker's okay. <laughs> now, he's been wonderful, though. I mean, he's, he's changed a lot, of, a lot of kids' perspectives, and they're eager to come. Our attendance has been better in some of our classrooms that really like him. and So an all-around change for everybody, I think. Oh, I think that's we'll really positive. Him. Very positive. Wow. Thank you so much for coming no in. Thank you. Right now, we are going to take about a five minute break, uh, come back at about 15 after, and then we'll resume. Okay. Sure.